Okay, it's me, Lisa Letterer, um, from the Midwives of New Jersey. I am making a video, one of which I promised to make every day, which was very foolish of me. Um, so anyway, I'm not making them every day, and as you can well tell, and I've been working on a blog about protecting your perineum, so I thought I would make a video about protecting your perineum. So. I also thought maybe you would like to see my face because we don't see faces anymore and it's nice to see people's faces. So on even on video, it's nice to see your face um, and remember what you look like in, in the past, what you used to look like. So anyway, um, you know, it's your perineum, your vagina and the parts around your vagina are um, pretty important places that we uh, like just the way they are and it's quite a daunting thought that something as large as a baby is going to come through there um, that it can actually open up and make room for something as large as that to come through it can um, but our hope is that as this beautiful child comes through it doesn't leave a lot of damage and and I think that there's things that you can do. Of course, there's times when there's really nothing you could have done, nothing your provider could have done. It just is, just is. But um, always um, we're trying to teach you how to give yourself the best odds of having the birth you want, the pregnancy you want, um, and of course the perineum that you want at the end of your birth. So um, some of the things some of the ways is by creating healthy tissue um, to prevent tearing of your perineum. Um, healthy tissue is made from the inside out. So for the most part, um, it's what you eat and um, maybe some supplements. Uh, but, you know, overall fruits and vegetables, things that are full of vitamin C, uh, omega-3s, um, something called cysteine. Um, which is found in beta keratin, the main protein in nails, skin, and hair. And it is important in the creation of collagen. So it affects the elasticity and um, texture of skin. So elasticity sounds good. Sounds like something we might want in a vagina that's going to give birth. So anyway, we have that to think about. Um, cysteine is found in meat and um mostly animal products, but you can also find it in garlic, onions, red bell peppers, oats, Brussels sprouts, and wheat germ. So some other places to get cysteine, which is essential in the production of collagen, as is vitamin C. Um, and collagen is what makes your skin and hopefully makes it as healthy. And healthy tissue does what it's supposed to do, and vaginal tissue is supposed to stretch. So um there's something called gamma linolenic acid, GLA. And GLA is, um, is what's in evening primrose oil. So most people who've been around midwives have an idea about evening primrose oil helping to ripen your cervix or make your cervix softer, but it can also make your vaginal tissues softer and stretchier too. So I think that um, we consider evening primrose oil a prostaglandin precursor and prostaglandins are what we use to, to ripen the cervix to start labor when we're gonna do an induction of labor. So interesting that um, we can use that pre previous, you know, to encourage your body to make more prostaglandins, hopefully to create an even stretchier, softer vagina. Um, you, you can also try uh, selenium, silica, and vitamin E, all known to improve the quality of your skin and tissues. Vitamin E is good for veins. So you don't need a lot of it. Um, and I don't have any food sources <laughs> offhand. Um, so perineal massage, which I honestly have not been a big fan of. But the I guess because it doesn't really make sense to me that 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 would work, but I think that the studies have shown it does. Um, it improves, perineal massage improves outcomes for first time moms. So if you're having your first baby and you wanna try some perineal massage, then I think it's worth your while um, to try to have to try to have the perineum that you want to have, of course. Um, you could do the perineal massage with evening primrose oil if you wanted. 
worth a shot. Um, so during labor, during labor, you know, according to who's taking care of you, you're going to have more and less choice about how you're delivering your baby. But to know what's ideal is good <clears throat> so that you could at least ask for these things, um, even if it's not the usual um, policy or procedure for the place you're at. I think you, it never hurts to ask. And sometimes you get agreeable people who are like, why not? Of course you can try that. Um, so being upright, actually delivering your baby standing, which is interesting, is good for your perineum. Uh, hard to do. And I don't personally love it because standing means that the baby has a long way to drop till it hits the surface. Um, so that means I have to hang on to the baby, make sure it doesn't hit the, hit the ground, you know. So that makes me a little anxious, but I would do it. I would throw a pillow between your legs and I would do it if you were standing up um, because, of course, you're in charge. You're having the baby. Um, also kneeling and hands and knees, which I would say are the most common positions that women give birth in. They are um, very good for the perineum. Um, even squatting, uh, in my experience, squatting can put um, an undue amount of pressure on the perineum for first time moms in particular. So I will have them get into the semi squat, kind of lean back a little bit off of that deep squat or um, in the tub. It's really easy because moms put their, you can't see me, but they put their arms up um, and maybe get held under their armpits up and they just they're on their feet but they're reclining and it's a real soft squat um, which is I think I think is better I don't guess the studies necessarily show that but I think it's good to be upright and squatting is a great way to push out a baby it's just that when the baby actually hits the perineum um, it's so effective at moving the baby that sometimes it does not allow the vaginal tissues to stretch quickly enough as fast as that baby is coming out um, you know when you have subsequent babies everything stretches faster so it's that's less of a risk or less of a concern um, warm compresses to your perineum I've been thinking about this I mean we don't generally do that either but we certainly could um, we do so many labors and births in in the tub of water and that tub of water does a lot to soften uh, vaginal tissue and perineal tissue. So uh, a lot of times that's the, the warm compress that we're using, but um, but we could do that. We can put rags in a crock pot or in a, I was thinking like a baby wipes warmer and then put the washcloth on your bottom and then um, just keep turning them around. We can, um, we can have a whole pile of them so that we don't use them twice and get the container, the warming container dirty, of course. Um, but that's, that's worth a shot and it has shown in studies to help the perineum stretch. So, um, I think when you're pushing your baby out, um, people are often on their backs with their knees pulled back. You grab behind your legs, pull your knees back and out so that it's, you know, so you're stretched out, stretched out. I don't know. I'm too narrow on this screen. Um, but you know what I mean, how people are, um, pushing out their babies. Well, that, that pulls the perineum so taut and so tight. And um, if you just put your feet down on the bed and bring your knees a little closer together, that will create a lot more give in your perineum and, um, uh, and help you to not tear. Um, I think sometimes at the end, you know, I don't, I don't deliver too many babies where I'm not in charge, but sometimes I kind of lose control of things. And there's a nurse or a person in the room who's saying, push, 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 push. And I'm like, no, 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 no. You've got to stop pushing now. You know, you've got to breathe and push. So I'll say push and breathe, push and breathe, push and breathe and bring the baby's head over the perineum slowly, slowly, slowly. Um, the, I think that, how you push is, uh, or when you push is important. It, you should wait to be pushing your baby out until you feel like pushing your baby out because usually that means the baby has come low enough down to the to the pelvic floor and that's what stimulates the, the uh, fetal ejection reflex. My hair is a wreck, sorry. Um, I, I had to cancel my hair appointment for Thursday, so 
it's a problem. Um, but once that this, when you do that, when you don't push until you really feel like pushing, until your body is really pushing the baby out, if you wait until then, the lack of, of continuous over and over and over and over pushing decreases the swelling of that tissue. It gets so swollen after a while, um, after lots and lots and lots of pushing. And again, sometimes that is not to be avoided. And I find it in my own experience that sometimes we have to push like crazy and sometimes the woman never really gets an urge to push and so we just have to start at some point and that's just how it goes sometimes but but on the other hand people are asked to start pushing simply because there's no more cervix simply because they're 10 centimeters and that's really not a good reason to start pushing the baby needs to descend and hit hit closer to the perineal floor and then um you'll find that you feel like pushing you'll push a much shorter period of time and that will help those tissues to stretch too um even if you have um as far as pushing in positions, even if you have an epidural, a lot of times you can still get up in a squat using a squat bar because your arms will help hold you even if your legs are a little weak or um, flip over onto your hands and knees. I like to use the the cub pillow, the comfortable upright birth pillow that um, women can lean way over on. It's, it's um, you'd have to look it up, but it's it's a good thing for an epidural person. If you think you're going to get an epidural, it wouldn't be a bad plan for you to buy one and take it with you to the hospital. They blow up, so they're really easy to transport. We have one in our locker, and um, and I've used it a lot at the hospital, and the birth center has a couple of them, so um, which we use a lot. Um, so the the what else did i have on my list of things sometimes you can ask your midwife or your provider to keep the baby's head flexed as it's coming across the perineum so if the baby's head is tipped down like this it comes through the vagina and it then it comes up like this if it starts coming up before it's entirely born it needs a wider amount of space there needs to be more stretching so if you keep the baby's head flexed its chin down until it gets its chin out then it can extend then that will um, help save the perineum too um, women will sometimes just take their hand and push down uh, by the, the top tissues which that hurt and they feel pain and so they'll push the baby's head down away from that and that accomplishes the same thing so um if you don't think your provider's doing that and you're feeling a lot of burning, you could do that. I don't think, I think it's important to try to touch the baby and not your tissues, which, because a lot of poking at that really pulled tissue sometimes will cause it to tear a little, just touching it. So, um, but, but that's a good technique. And I find that it's often just instinctual for women to do that. Um, I think if you wait, to push out the baby's shoulders until after the um, after the contraction, the next contraction comes. So the baby's after the head delivers. Wait for the next contraction, then push out the shoulders. That will allow the shoulders to rotate into a different plane, which will put less um, less stress on the perineum and less likely to tear. Because definitely, definitely, I have seen babies' shoulders tear the perineum or their arm will fling up and that will tear the perineum so we try to keep control of it but it, you often cannot especially in the water a baby just comes as it comes but anyway waiting after the head for the next contraction to push out the body if even if you're in the water the baby is fine underwater totally fine so you can leave them there and wait for the next contraction which will give you a lot of force to deliver the shoulders but it will also deliver the shoulders in an oblique plane so that helps um, if you have stitches if you don't have stitches your bottom is likely to feel very swollen and uncomfortable after you have a baby go figure so the um Frozen witch hazel pads are great for your bottom. The hospital has the ice packs that they pop and put on your bottom and they're fine, but they don't stay cold very long and there's no medicine on them or anything. They're just cold things um, that are cold for a little bit. 
So they're worth doing when you're in the hospital. But once you get home, if you could take some pads, nice thick pads, not not like panty liner kind of pads, but thick pads um, and pour witch hazel on them and freeze it, you make something we call a witch sickle. And those are very, very popular amongst recently delivered women um, to bring soothing coolness and um, um, anti-inflammatory uh, properties, whatever, which hazel will decrease inflammation to your vagina, vaginal tissues. We have in the Essential Market, which is our online store, uh, we have something called Gentle Birth, uh, Gentle Birth Essentials. It's a kit. And in that kit, there's a few more things besides besides the witch hazel and the pads are organic everything is organic it's there it's really nice it makes really 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 especially nice witch sickles and um i think they're good for um shower gifts too i i i do i mean i know i'm selling our stuff but we do we do have this stuff because we think it's um beneficial to you and that's why we have it so um the gentle birth gentle birth essentials no that's not what it's called oh i have to change that it's called perineal bliss i think <laughs> son of a gun anyway the other one is a, is a bunch of herbs to ripen your cervix so the it's a perineal pack that you'll find on the store sorry um so that's worth trying an herbal sits bath is worth trying um and and not sitting directly on your bottom. That's very helpful is that people end up sitting on their perineum a lot because they're nursing. If you can tip even your, your butt just a little bit to the side, if you can um, lay down after you breastfeed, um, lay down on your sides, just try to decrease the amount of pressure in that area. Um, it will allow better blood flow and the lymph system to drain better. So, um, I also would recommend you not look at your bottom. It is not going to look like what you expect it to look like most of the time. And my most fervent recommendation is to not look at it. Um, when I look at your bottom in a week or two after your birth, I'm a little bit concerned about how it's all going to go and happily surprised at six weeks that it looks fine, entirely healed almost all the time. So it, it doesn't look great in the beginning, so there's nothing really for you to look at. If you have a lot of pain um, or feel something's wrong about it, go in and be seen and let somebody look at your bottom. But I don't know that you looking at it, uh, you have very little perspective. Uh, one time I had a woman who had had, she had an episiotomy actually. No. Oh, that woman had an episiotomy and I had waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. I swear to God, that baby was crowning up this much for half an hour and it would not give. It must not have been that much. It must have been this much, but would not give, would not give, would not give. I mean, on and on and on and on and on. So eventually I made my version of episiotomy, which is the tiniest little snip that will help the tissue open up a little bit and give a little bit. And um, when she came back for her postpartum visit, she was there with her husband and she said, uh, Lisa, I really have to ask you, did I need an episiotomy? And her husband said, yes, yes, you did. You absolutely did. And so I didn't even have to answer. But sometimes, once in a while, we need these things. We need some help. It's not, um, I have a, a client who I've been at both of her births and I've cut an episiotomy both times. And I mean, again, I mean, waited and waited and waited and waited and waited. I have so much patience for the perineum to stretch and did not. And eventually the baby usually starts to decompensate and be unhappy about being squished in that spot for so long and needs to be born. And so sometimes the tiniest little clip will open up enough to get the baby out. It's usually, we don't need a lot of space. It doesn't take much. Um, so you, you can't be so against interventions. You just have to try to avoid them as much as possible. Um, I would say, um, remember that your vagina will be more dry. It will be um, different when you make love. So. Take your time getting back to intimacy. Take your time, maybe have a glass of wine, maybe um, maybe use some lubricant of sorts. 
I'm gonna get pretty about to get a tickle in my throat. Um, and you know, you don't really have to have anything in your vagina right away to make love. So take your time and, and give it time uh, to be sure that it's not going to hurt. Uh, because if you have intercourse and it hurts, you are very likely to not want to do it again anytime soon. So I think it's best to wait until you're ready and everything goes fine. And so, you know, if you think things aren't healing the way they should, um, you can always, um, you can always um, call us and come in and be seen or go see your provider. Um, sometimes we'll do some, um, give you some recommendations for that. But anyway, so this was a fair video about protecting the perineum. I've done better. Oh, I know. That was the story I was going to tell you. So then I had a woman come to me and say, something's wrong. It isn't right my bottom so I said okay okay let me look at it and I looked at it, I said no it, it's fine it's really fine and she said nope it is not right this is not the way it is and I was like yeah I mean after you have a baby your bottom stops looking like a little girl's bottom and it sits more open you can see your vagina more it it is different I mean but it is normal and fine no Lisa absolutely not there's something wrong it has to be fixed and I said how many vaginas have you looked at and she said, well, I guess you're right. I said, yep, I do this all the time. And I look at these bottoms all the time and you look fine and it doesn't hurt you and it's functioning fine. It just looks different. It changes. It changes into a, a different, more open, blossoming, beautiful part of your body. Um, but there's nothing wrong with it in particular. So that's my talk on protecting your perineum. I hope you have a great day. And I'll talk to you again another time.